Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in, this, in these videos, I take a sampling of different used guns that come through the door and do a one to two minute review on each to give you guys a good a wide array or a good sampling of different firearms that might exist on the market that you might be interested in or do some further research on yourself. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be educational. I'm not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. Remember the process of these videos is we start off with the most common and then move through the least common as we go through the videos. Starting off in the number one spot, this is a Smith & Wesson m and Bodyguard 380. As the name would suggest, this is a 380 ACP handgun. Now the first m and Bodyguard would come out onto the market in 2011 and then those would be produced until 2014 when they did introduce the m and or the bodyguard to the M&P line, uh, adding some stylizing changes to it to, to make it sort of fit in with the M&P line, like fish scale side serrations and things like that. And they are still producing these today. So when these would first come out, it was sort of in that era of the, uh, between about the 2005 to 2010 time when different companies like Taurus with the TCP, of course, Smith & Wesson with the bodyguard, uh, Ruger with the LCP, Keltec with the P3AT, when these small pocket sized 380s with a polymer frame and a metal slide started becoming very popular. And if you can remember around the 2010 to 2015 time frame, there was about those five main manufacturers that made these. Now, of course, they're being made by different companies uh, in different uh, configurations like the car 380s. Uh, Glock now has a 380 version. So that would sort of set the stage. This would be one of the first early appearances of these small pocket size polymer 380 pistols to enter the marketplace. So you do have a single stack six round magazine. This, this uh, particular one does come with a Crimson Trace laser, which is a factory option, sort of integral into the frame. Now with the Crimson Trace laser, brand new, these are about in the 350 to $400 price point where you find them. Uh, use you're gonna find them between about two and 300 depending on condition and things like that and depending on if it comes with its original box or anything like that. Now these are a hammer fired, integral hammer, double action only firearm. And there is, uh, not on this one, but you can get a manual safety option of course, this one does not have a manual safety. So uh, they are sort of heralded as being, as far as pocket guns go, having a lot of safety options available to them. Uh, not a lot of the little pocket 380s do come with a safety. Typically, you just have a really heavy trigger pull. Uh, that was true of the Ruger LCP until they came out with the LCP2, which has a trigger safety. Uh, but of course, this one ha would have that manual safety option if you want it. But these have always been very popular handguns, very reliable, of course, being so small, they are a little bit snappy, but a great summertime carry, deep concealment pocket carry type of gun. Uh, this one has a two mags, a little pocket holster. Well, it's actually got a clip on it, so you can do inside the waistband if you want, and original box with the Crimson Trace laser. So just a really good setup. For the price point, definitely recommend taking a look at one if you see one available at your Dior's uh, store. Up next is not an FN, it's actually a Smith & Wesson 9mm shield. Previous owners just had it in an FN box. Here's script tape on here. So the first generation M&Ps, as many of you guys might know who watch these videos, I actually carry and have carried one of these as my inside the waistband firearm, the first gen. I have had it for a about seven or eight years. These would come onto the scene, gosh, going on about nine or so years ago. So these have been out for for a uh, quite a while. Now, a couple years ago, they did come out with the 2.0, which the revisions were uh, like front side serrations, more aggressive texturing on the grip panels. Of course, this has the tape on it, but the standard factory texturing is actually very, very smooth with very little to no texturing on the grip. So obviously that's why the previous owner put on some uh, uh, talon tape here. And the 2.0 has a slightly lighter trigger pull with an over travel stop on it. Um, I personally, pound for pound, like the first generation shield a little bit more. You know, and I have, like I said, owned and carried mine for such a long time, so that's probably why. Uh, they do come factory new with an eight round and a seven round magazine. This one, here's the seven, and then this one has two eights, and the previous owner put on a pinky extension on the seven rounder. But typically the seven rounder has a flush mounted floor plate and there is an extension on the eight rounder. So you can kind of have a little bit of variety in how you want to carry the firearm. 
nine millimeter single stack. These have really ruled the market in my store, at least in the concealed carry option. Uh, now things like the SIG 365 and the Hellcat are kind of taking over in that realm. But the great thing about the first gen shields on the market today is you can find them new uh, in some cases on sale uh, if you're patient enough, but we've actually even had them in our store new for like 289 and you can find these uh, under normal circumstances, you should be able to find them used again between about 150 to 200 dollars if you're patient enough. So um, for the money, if you pick one up, you use a very, very inexpensive and a really good carry option. I am a big fan of this firearm and I def uh, definitely recommend taking a look if you see one available for sale. Okay, up next I have a Walther P22. These are actually really, really good 22 semi-automatic handguns. Now this one is actually P22CA, so this is a California compliant uh, P22, and as far as my research tells me, what makes the uh, P22CA, the California compliant version, is there are no wrench flats on the front of the little muzzle nut, the little barrel nut up here, and also they put some sort of Loctite or something on here so it's not easily removed because with California compliance, I think it's something like you can't have a thread, threaded barrel or a threaded barrel cannot be easily accessible. So that's really all they had to change on this to make it California compliant. Per my understanding, I don't live in California so I don't know for sure, but that's what I read on a couple forums about this. Otherwise, these are really, really good training handguns. It is a little bit smaller, so not a direct translation over from something like a P99 or a PPQ. If you want a uh, 22 training pistol that's more like uh, likened to its 9mm counterpart, that would be like a Glock 44, would translate to the Glock 19, or the M&P uh, 22C would translate over to the M&P 9mm C. So uh, anyway, still uh, really, really fun for first time shooters. Now, semi-automatic, 22 pistols can't be very picky on ammunition. I have found that the Walther P22 and then the Ruger SR22, which is more or less a copy of this gun, uh, function very well with a large variety of ammunition. It's always recommended to run a high velocity, uh, usually jacketed or a, a coated uh, projectile through a semi-automatic action. But anyway, uh, it is expected that you will get at least a, a jam here and there. It's pretty much goes with the ter territory of a semi-automatic 22, which is one of the reasons I never really recommend a semi-automatic 22 as a defensive option. Nothing wrong with the power of the round. It is, of course, anemic compared to other things like a 380 or even a 32, but you do have to be careful with the uh, functionality, making sure that, of course, the action moves uh, freely. You're not getting a lot of buildup of grime and debris in there. The parts are very small, so it's very quickly, they do foul up and get very dirty very fast. So, again, as long as you're taking care of it, cleaning it frequently and using a high velocity or high quality ammunition, you shouldn't have no problems with it. But really, really fun for training, things like this. You know, uh, new, the Walther P22s are around the $300 mark used. You should find them in around the $200 mark. So very affordable, fun way to train and practice at the range without burning up all your more expensive 9 and 45, especially in times like these where that ammunition is not easy to come by. All right, next up I have a CZ75 SP01. The SP01 here has night sights and it has a uh, elongated magazine holding 18 rounds. CZ75 has been one of CZ's flagship handguns for quite a long time. Uh, this is a 9mm double single action firearm with a full metal frame and slide, so a really good amount of heft and weight to it. Firearms like these make excellent range guns and home defense guns and duty sidearms. Of course, for concealed carry, they are a little bit on the large and the heavy side. With the 18 round capacity, they make, like I said, really, really fun target shooters. A nice long sight radius, long barrel, a good balance, great ergonomics. These feel excellent in the hand. Because you have the double single action capability, you have more control over the firearm, a very light trigger pull on a single action. So obviously a great option there. Uh, CZ as a company has been around for a very long time. The CZ 75, of course, since the 70s has been a staple of their handgun lineup and still is a really, it's a leader in the full frame, full size sidearm or uh, handgun market. 
These are always great sellers when they come through the door. A very reliable, uh, just very well received in the marketplace. Everybody respects the CZ. It's hard to find people who do not like them. Now one defining characteristic of most CZ handgun products is the slide and frame configuration. So the slide does fit inside the frame as opposed to the slide fitting around the frame, which is traditionally what you see on most options. That basically gives you two things. One is a very, very narrow slide profile, which you see here. So you have very kind of little to grip, to grip onto. That's kind of the negative there. The positive though is it gives you a very low bore axis, which gives you very low muzzle flip and sort of a direct linear uh, recoil impulse. So really, really controllable and easy to get back on target for follow-up shots, which is one thing that makes these such a unique and excellent design. Lots of companies have started copying this, especially a lot of the options coming out of Turkey. Uh, just because it is a really good, it's a unique design and it does absolutely have a benefit in terms of getting quick shots downrange on target accurately. So something like this, the 75 SP01 is going to be new in about the 6 to 650 range, new between about 5 and 550. I'm sorry, you, uh, new 6 to 650 used about 5 to 550. So uh, definitely worth taking a look at if you see one. They are very, very nice handguns. All right, up next is one I actually don't see come through here too often. And these are actually really nice handguns. This is a Ruger New Vaquero. This is in the Bisley configuration, and this is a 357. They made them in 45 Colt, among a couple other calibers, I believe, but this one is a 357. For modern recreation, cowboy action shooting, single action revolvers, 357 does tend to be the most popular. Now, for people who are more into things like the Cimarron, the Uberti, or an actual Colt, you tend to see those go more in the 45 Colt, uh, as people like the more authenticity. These, I would say, resemble a Old West single action army, but internally there are quite a few differences. So first and foremost, the Bisley. What makes this a Bisley, and this was an actual legitimate design configuration, is a swoop down hammer spur in the back. So you can actually see, you can actually, well, you can get to the hammer spur a lot easier without having to tilt or change the grip here on the, on the pistol. So on some of them under normal configuration, you'd have to sort of break your grip to reach up and grab the hammer spur. But you can also see down the sights with the hammer in the down uh, position. Normally with a normal ham hammer spur configuration, you cannot see down the sights with the hammer uh, in the resting position like this, which doesn't really matter because it is single action only and it cannot fire unless the hammer is brought back first. The other thing is the grip angle. So the grip has a more steep turn down to it, sort of a more vertical feel as opposed to the more swooped back version of a standard single action army. So those are the two main uh, differences of the Bisley configuration. Now. The new Vaquero over a single action army. So a traditional single action army, you do have to bring the uh, fire the the hammer. I'm sorry to half cock to load and unload the firearm. In fact, here on the firearm, you get one and two cocks on an original single action army there would be four but anyway from the resting position you can actually open up the loading gate and that will in turn drop the cylinder stop by itself so you do not have to engage the hammer in order to do that from there you can freely turn the cylinder to load and to unload the firearms that's one main difference there the other difference is you have a transfer bar here in the back. And an original single action army, of course, would not have that. You would have the hammer mounted right up here to the front of the, uh, the, uh, the hammer, I'm sorry, the firing pin mounted up to the face of the hammer itself. Now, it is because of that that most people who use single action armies will load around, skip a chamber, and then load four. That, that way, when you, you know, load your round, you skip, you load four. When you bring the hammer back and then back down, you are resting on an empty chamber so therefore, when you go to use the firearm drawing, will then give you five subsequent rounds in a row. So you actually have five rounds instead of six, even though there are six chambers in the cylinder, just for safety purposes, because in the early days, if you break your safety latch or something like that, you drop it on its hammer, there is a firing pin there and no safe way or any direction for the striker to go other than into the back of a primer on a loaded chamber. So that was one safe way to, uh, people would save their legs and their horses back in the day. So traditional use of a single action army. Because there is a transfer bar, uh, this cannot fire at all unless fully brought back and as the hammer moves forward or unless the trigger is pulled, the transfer bar will move out of the way, therefore you cannot fire the gun. It will not 
allow that transfer bar to transfer the energy from the hammer to the back of the firing pin. So just a safety feature there, of course, because of those really those two main internal functions, it's quite a bit of a departure from the original single action army design. So uh, a lot of purists do not like this idea, but if you want something that looks the part and has the same sort of function to it, really nice classic looking fight. It also feels pretty heavy too um, compared to an original. Uh, it's a good way to go and on the new market these are in about the seven to eight hundred dollar range used. Uh, they really do maintain a lot of their value as long as they're in good shape. You'll be looking about you know six six fifty or so. Okay up next and I actually had one of these in a video about three weeks ago so I just got in another one. This is the prolific Winchester model 1897. One of the most popular and well-regarded pump action shotguns that has been around for a very long time, over a hundred years. Um, of course, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest claims to fame on these was the use in World War One, World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam as a trend, the trench shotgun configuration, uh, along with the Model 12s and the uh, Ithaca 37s. Those were the three most popularly used, and this would probably be the most iconic of the three, having the hammer here on the back. Um, in this configuration, just in its sporting configuration, they are not wholly expensive. I mean, depending on your production, whether it's a takedown or not, uh, its overall condition, they get upwards of about the $600 mark. Uh, shooter grade guns will be probably around more than three or 400. Uh, this one had a little bit of an inletting or engraving right here in the back. Um, also, it looks like it's been re-blued. So it is a really nice, I'd say this is a shooter grade firearm, so maybe around the three to $400 mark. If you do have a World War II or World War I era trench gun, and I actually had a really nice example of a World War I 1897, and it was all correct and authentic. Uh, that one we had in the cost, that was about eight years ago. Uh, it was before I opened, that was out of my personal collection. I think I ended up selling that for somewhere around $3,500 or $4,000. So those go for a lot of money. Uh, but either way, internally, they are the same gun. Very fun to shoot, very reliable. Just an all-around great shotgun and when they come in there's always you know buyers ready to uh, take them home so really cool to see them come in okay up next i have a very popular shotgun this is the winchester super x model one now if there were going to be two shotguns in history that have the biggest colt following and i'll say the two semi-automatic shotguns that have the biggest colt following i would say uh, the Browning A5, the Auto 5, and then probably this one, the Winchester Super X Model 1. And that's in terms of people who just absolutely love those shotguns, love shooting them, love collecting them. It is hard to find people who own a Super X Model 1 or an A5 who just do not have nothing but, you know, just great things to say about them. So the Super X Model 1 entered the scene in the early 1970s. It was, I believe, around 1973. And uh, it would actually be a sort of a revised or revamped version of the, uh, off of the success of the Model 12. So they would change up a couple things, the feeding system, the gas system, the loading system. Very, very smooth operation. And the biggest competitor to this at the time would be the Remington 1100. Now I had an 1100 on one of these episodes, maybe one or two episodes ago. And if you remember around that time, uh, the Remington 1100 was the best selling shotgun through about the 70s and 80s uh, in the United States and definitely competed mainly on a price point level against the Super X Model 1, which is really the thorn in the side of this firearm. Quality was definitely very high, uh, made out of American Walnut uh, stock, I'm sorry, steel receiver, very nice rich blue finish on these, and they're just excellent, excellent firearms. Uh, pricing on these is really hard to nail down. They made these in different grades and different configurations. This one has a vent rib barrel with nice engraving. I'm um, sorry, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, checkering on the stock set here. Uh, very nice. Uh, this one has definitely been used. It's not abused. I would say probably overall about 85 to 90 percent condition. Uh, something like this would go in about the five to six hundred dollar price point. Uh, but you can get, you know, these, uh, you know, Super X Model 1s in excellent condition and upwards of two, three thousand dollars depending on what grade they are, you know, if they're really, really lightly used and in good shape. So a very, very wide price point on these and again, a huge following and they are actually really, really, really good semi-automatic shotgun. So if you want to find one for sporting, sporting purposes, 
you should, like I said, be able to find them at about the price of where you're gonna find a nice Model 12 or a nice 1100. They all sort of hover in about the same price point, but these do get very expensive very quickly if you find them in really good condition. So uh, really happy to see a Super X Model 1 come in. I think I've only ever had one other one in here, so they are not very common. Uh, people do tend to hold on to them. So just an excellent shotgun if you ever get a chance to shoot one. Okay, last but not least, I have here a very iconic Chris Vector. Um, now, these would go into development in about 2006, 2007, and production would begin in about 2009. Um, these, of course, are really well known for their full auto submachine gun counterparts, which have a super high rate of fire, somewhere around the 1,500 rounds per minute mark. Now, these were offered uh, between the civilian and the sort of the military configurations, if you are the full auto configurations, it's probably more accurate, but they were offered in 9 by 19, so 9 parabellum, 9 by 21, 45, 40, 10 millimeter, and 22 long rifle. This one here is a 45, and they are most aptly known as being in the 45 chambering, 45 or 10 millimeter, one or the other. The design is a delayed blowback, and what you have is a clo closed bolt mechanism, and when the firearm fires, it actually, there is a break or a link in the bolt, which causes it to tilt and turn downward into this recess here. So it's sort of moving in a back and downward configuration, which the theory behind is at the end of its travel of the bolt, the mass is actually moving down, which is giving you a downward impulse on recoil instead of a lateral backward uh, recoil impulse which with something like a 45 and such a high fire rate in a lightweight package of course would usually be very uncontrollable because but because of that change in the inertia of the force and the recoil it actually helps keep the muzzle down and actually makes a really controllable shooting experience in full auto now unfortunately i've never fired one of these in full auto but i have actually uh, fired these i actually got this in last week and I took it out to the range because I had never fired one before uh, in 45. And actually, it's a remarkably controllable and really, really fun to shoot. Very little recoil impulse. So, very enjoyable. Now, you are going to notice this suppressor out here at the end. This is actually a fake suppressor. And what it's doing is covering the very long and weird looking barrel that would be out here at the end. You do notice that there is a real stock, it's not a pistol brace. Because that stock is on there, the barrel length has to be 16 inches or longer to comply uh, with federal law on the barrel length SBR laws, if you will. So uh, without a tax stamp on this, which this is not an SBR, a short barreled rifle, it has to have a barrel length over 16 inches and better to have a fake suppressor on it than a weird looking just long barrel sticking out the end. Now they do make a pistol configuration. So the actual submachine gun version of this, the barrel of course would stop about right here. So they do make a handgun configuration of this with a brace option if you want the more traditional look and feel of the firearm. Alternatively, you can also get the pistol version and then file for a uh, Form 1 tax stamp to make it an SBR if you want to do that as well. But a really, really cool, very unique, boxy looking design really breaks the rules on how firearms traditionally look. But uh, just something that's unique and different and, and very, very cool, uh, brand new. They're not difficult under normal circumstances to find. I mean, we could get these anytime we wanted to back before all this panic started. Uh, and they were typically used, I'm sorry, new about that 16, 17, $1,800 range, somewhere around there. Now used, they are going between about 12 and 15 right now, of course, because of the way the market is. Uh, but typically 1,000 to 12 is where you're gonna find it under normal conditions. Uh, but this one here just has the one mag and it does have a different stock on it, a more traditional Chris Vector stock, but this is a collapsible uh, AR buffer tube style. Uh, and so anyway, very, very cool to see come in. This is the only used Chris Vector I've ever had. So it takes the number eight spot and that is that one for you. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you have any uh, questions for me, please leave those down in the comment section. And also, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. Uh, anyway, guys, I'm gonna leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.